Hey folks, my name is Amesa with The Root School. Uh, I have a tremendous amount of love for being out birding, especially having close interactions with birds. Being able to see detail up close, those flashes of color, uh, is very exciting. Being able to witness a bird singing from a close proximity can have a tremendous amount of assistance in helping learn that song. However, it's really worth making note that the baseline for birds, while it may seem very pleasant, full of song, a lot of color, it's beautiful, it's happy. In reality, bird day to day, especially through breeding season, is a struggle. Uh, there's a lot of survival and competition with other birds of their own species. Um, and so making note of those challenges that the birds are going through ends up being really important as far as how we move across the landscape and interact with those individuals. Having an awareness of the bird behavior that you're experiencing around you can be a really important indicator as to uh, how much disturbance and stress your presence is causing for the birds, which as a result means that the awareness you have of your own self movements across the landscape and your own interactions with these birds ends up making a really big difference. So birds on the day to day, especially during breeding season, are competing with one another around territories. They're competing against possible predation, which ranges from birds of prey to rodents to even deer. If they find a nest that is accessible to them, they will predate. So while birds are facing predation and competition within their own species during the breeding season, our movements across the land are gonna impact the level of disturbance for them pretty significantly. There's a lot of risk of interfering with nesting patterns, uh, potentially not seeing a nest, and disturbing that in and of itself is a big impact. So having an awareness of yourself, what you're looking at, and how you're moving ends up playing a really important role in how much of a stress level you're bringing to the birds. In addition to predation and interspecies competition for space, realistically human development and interference has impacted the overall bird populations really dramatically. And across the board, bird populations are largely in decline, mostly because of those components. So today we're going to focus on some of the important components to proper birding code of ethics. One of the first things that's really worth making note of is based on the season that you're out birding is gonna shift some of the patterns that are worth following a little bit. So for example, in the winter, you're not gonna to have to worry about disturbing nesting activities. You're not gonna to have to worry about disturbing birds quite to the same level. Though it is important noting that their feeding practices in the winter can literally mean the difference of survival or death through a single night. Staying on trail, in the summer breeding months is very important, especially if you're birding with a group. If you're birding solo, it can be a little bit safer to be venturing off trail and exploring some of the more intricate depths of the landscape that you're on. As a group though, pushing through thick brush and across a landscape has a compounded scale of disruption and stress that it can cause. Even if you're moving through a landscape on your own, it can still have tremendous impacts on the birds that are occupying those spaces. It ultimately ends up coming down to making sure you're paying attention to your footing, paying attention to how the birds are responding to you. Uh, is it a group of birds that are alarmed at your presence or is it a single female that is very upset with your presence? Is nobody upset with your presence? Paying attention to these things is ultimately going to help guide you and keep you clear from having a significant impact on nesting patterns and overall day-to-day -day, uh, baseline for the birds. If you do find a nest, it's really important to try and keep your distance, back away, observe from a distance. You don't want to inter be interfering with the parental care of that nest regardless of the stage of nesting that it is. If, even if they're just in the process of building the nest for the first time, 
your discovery of it could end up pushing them from even attempting to nest in that location and would start them from scratch in a new spot. If there are eggs in there, incubation is critical and disruption of that is a bit, has a big impact. If there's nestlings in there, the consistent parental feeding and care of those nestlings is very, very important. Something else worth noting about finding a bird's nest is you may or may not be aware, but oftentimes there are jays and other birds that pay attention to the disturbances you cause. By taking advantage of those moments, they often can find the nest that you just found and have access to predate and utilize that to their own advantage. As the parents are distracted by your presence, the parents may not be paying attention to the jays, which could now know where the nest is. A good way to do some quality bird observation during their baseline is to find yourself a nice sit spot where you can comfortably sit and stay still and quiet. Roughly 20 minutes after a major disturbance, birds will start to regain their baseline patterns, which can be a great way for you to observe the behavior tendencies of individual species and get a first-hand look at some of those intricate details of behaviors and patterns. So there are a couple techniques that people often end up utilizing to try and get the sighting that they really want. Uh, one of them being playback uh, and the other being pishing. Psh, psh, psh. These are slightly different tactics that ultimately end up having similar results. Playback tends to be very focused on an individual species and trying to get a sighting of that one species, whereas pishing is mimicking bird alarm calls and the species that will respond to that will be wide and varied. The pishing often ends up, because it's uh, mimicking the bird alarm call, often ends up having birds coming in in an already agitated and nervous state. For them, a predator seen is a predator that they don't need to worry about quite so much. So when a bird starts to send off an alarm, the other birds want to come in and have a look at what's going on, what they need to be aware of and nervous about. Bird song and playback can definitely be a way to bring in an individual species. What that's actually doing though is making the males in their territory feel as though there is another male of their species that is now in competition for that territory space. So it ends up putting stress on individuals who may otherwise be spending their time taking care of their nests or their mates or their fledglings and often ends up just being that draw and distraction for them from what they really should be focused on. So if you're going to be using playback and pishing as a tactic for bringing in the birds that you want to observe, it's good to make sure you're keeping that as, a, as brief a span as possible, keeping that window short and then moving on from that location. This gives them the ability to as quickly as possible get back into their baseline patterns and have that disruption move on. With these tactics, it's also really important to note that these should not be used when trying to observe endangered or threatened species. They're gonna be so heavily impacted by these actions that it can have severe detrimental effects on how successful they are with their breeding patterns. Definitely better to try and use them as little as possible overall. Typically, if you're moving slow and smooth across a landscape, you're gonna end up having a good amount of interactions with the birds around you, and they're gonna stay in a level of baseline. Whereas if you're using alarm calls, it's gonna throw everybody into a distressed state. By moving slow across a landscape in and of itself will increase the amount of birds that you get to witness firsthand and being able to watch birds when they're at their baseline can be really important for being able to make note of behavioral patterns and what stages of the breeding season they're in. Um, it's also one of the most effective ways to see from a distance some recently fledged birds. Being able to see birds at their baseline should be the ultimate goal. So using something like a sit spot 
or moving slow across the landscape, these tactics are going to provide a lot more observation of baseline patterns and behavior than if you're using playback or pishing. Those two in and of themselves are going to cause a lot of distress. And what's most, the, one of the most important components to really learning a new bird and learning a new species is having first-hand observation of baseline behavioral patterns. Having birds interact with you that are completely in alarm and distress is only going to be one brief window of how these birds spend their day to day. A sit spot can be a great way to end up having surprising close interactions with birds that are not in distress and tends to be one of the most powerful moments when you have a bird land close and it's not stressed about your presence you get to fully witness what that bird looks like, how it behaves, how it forages for food, where it prefers to be in the landscape, whether it's down low, up high. Baseline observation is always gonna be a much more informative tactic to fully identify the species that you're after. Observation of birds at baseline is gonna be consistently the best way to have a full picture idea of behavioral patterns and what sort of habitat qualities these birds really prefer. You can get to have a much closer interaction and observation of what they prefer to feed on and have a sense of how big their territories are and where their favorite singing perches are. Whereas if you're using playback or pishing, they're just going to be focused on you and all those other components end up going out the window for a time for them because you are a potential threat. So where I'm at right now with the birds that I'm hearing, they're all very really pretty common species and with it being peak summer there's a lot of food sources, a lot of insects and berries all around so I feel pretty safe about doing a little bit of fishing, maybe a little bit of playback to see what we can pull in. So we've got a song sparrow that is reacting to the pishing. I'm going to see if I can call it in a little bit closer. Well, it's always exciting to observe and find new species or favorite species. Ultimately, if you love birds and bird watching as much as I do, your biggest goal should be preserving their ability to maintain their baseline and their necessary daily activities. Interfering with that is going to end up having negative effects on them and as a bird lover that should be an important component to how you address and how you go about your birding activities. The good news is with practice you can have great observations of birds around you and also have minimal negative impacts on the populace. They'll continue to go about their patterns and you can have full access witnessing of those day-to-day -day behaviors. As a final thought, if you are interested in learning more about proper birding code of ethics, I highly recommend checking out the American Birders Association. They have a great description of different practices to follow while you're out in the field doing your bird observations. It's important that birds end up having people who love and support and care about them because that ends up ultimately being a great way for us to work towards keeping habitat safe, keeping their patterns safe, and making sure that their daily patterns can maintain. So get out there, have some fun, be safe, practice, and try and be as respectful as you can of the bird populace around you.